Dun, 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 dun. I don't know if I got the last note exactly right. Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager speaking to you from, what should I say, Prager Central? We never gave this. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody. We are set to go on the Dennis Prager Show. The New York Times has an article. And uh, more and more political beliefs reflect religious beliefs. When politicians determine your religious beliefs, it's a, it's a, fa- it's a fascinating article. It's an inversion. It says that your politics will determine your religiosity more than your religiosity will determine your politics. It's an interesting theory. It's by a professor, which unfortunately today means nothing. I can't tell you how that hurts. I I want to speak personally for a moment. I love, I've always loved, since high school, since the beginning of high school, I have loved the life of the mind. The word intellectual was, was never a dirty word. It was a beautiful word. The word professor was probably, in my mind, the most idealized profession, more than doctor, more than clergy, wow, a professor of history. You have no idea how long it has taken me to have contempt for most people who are professors. It is, it, it is the greatest single change emotionally, I think, in my life. From reverence to contempt. Of course there are still professors worthy of a reverence. Of course. I have them on the show. I have uh, they make uh, videos for Prager University, of course. But right now, if I know you're a professor in the liberal arts, not to mention in the farce known as gender studies, in fact, almost anything with the word studies has become ludicrous. It's really it's a painful it's a painful thing. It's like when you, you know as you grow up. So, I, I, it's an interesting thing growing up. You can become, you could stay naive or innocent. You can become jaded or you can be just realistic. And I've never become jaded. Thank God. I meet kids who were 15 who are much more jaded than I am. However, it's painful when things that you revered And I don't idealize in the sense of, oh, if they have any flaws, you know, like you feel about your parents. Oh, they are flawed, so they're really nothing. They're hypocrites. I I, I must admit I didn't go through that stage. But the the professor issue has been a painful one. Who wrote about it, about the the professor being uh, just, was it Alan Dershowitz? Yeah, Alan Dershowitz was recently speaking about deans. And, and and how morally weak they are, the cowards of the, of the society. That's what dean means. What are they? What does the University of California at San Diego have? How many people? But what are they called? They're not called deans. Are you know deans of of inclusion? De- I'm sorry. No, no, I know inclusion and diversity. But what is their title? What is their title? It's not dean. It's uh, is it dean? All right. Anyway. So anyway, back to the point here. It's a professor who wrote this piece, which doesn't mean anything, but I'm just telling you. When politicians determine your religious beliefs, that as people vote Democrat, they become more secular. In other words, my theory, and I think most of yours is, the, the, the more secular vote more Democrat. And the more religious vote more Republican. Her theory is that, in fact, it's really at least as much the other way around. And I, there may be something to that. If you start buying left-wing ideas, and the Democratic Party is a left-wing party now, it is no longer a liberal party. I mean, the fact that it is now okay to be a Democrat and advocate the abolition of ICE means that we cannot enforce borders. That There is no more radical a left-wing position than 
you don't have borders to defend. And that is now normative Democrat, uh, Democratic Party policy. So if you, if you buy what they say, you, it's a sort of, she has a sort of behaviorist argument. If you do X, Y, and Z, then you'll end up X, Y, and Z. And that, that's my argument. I've, uh, you know, act happy, you'll be happy. Act kind, you'll be kind. Act loving, you'll feel love. Act religious, you'll start believing religiously. I'm a big behaviorist. So her behaviorism is if you vote Democrat over and over and over, you will become more secular. And if you vote Republican over and over and over, you'll become more religious. Isn't that an interesting argument? The other is obviously true. The religious tend to to, uh, vote uh, Republican and the secular the other way, which, by the way, is one of the reasons that I believe in God. I have said this very many times in many different ways, and it's always worth repeating. Having come to the realization of what happens when people stop believing in the God of the Bible, not just any God, the God of the Bible, the God of all the religions that would go under the rubric of Judeo-Christian values, when people stop believing that, moral chaos and intellectual chaos ensue. People who believe in the God of the Bible, and in the Bible, actually believe that there are two sexes, male and female. If you do not believe in that God, the odds are you think that there are 56, quote-unquote, genders. I'm not joking. Is that the number now at Facebook? Is it, it changes? Well, the last I looked, it was 56. Fair enough. The amount of absurdity, aside from moral idiocy that one learns in the secular world. It, it, it 71? Where? In the UK? On Facebook? There are 71 genders? I, I am curious. Did the people who came up with that want to mock the idea? I mean, because the, is there anybody listening, even if you are on the left? Do you believe there are 71 genders? You're sure you're sure about that. The UK Facebook sign up is 71. Look, my friends, the truth is if there are three, there's something farcical. There's male and female. Now you may not feel that you are either. That's a problem. But that's not a category. Get it? It's a problem, not a category. That let us say, I mean, what if you didn't feel fully human? And by the way, we have had that. There, this is actually a condition. I, I'm mocking not. I'm not making this up. There are people, there are very few. I, I predict it will, it will increase, but I, right now there are very few. But there are those who believe, I, I was reading about this, a woman who believed she's a cat. And she took on mannerisms of cats and so on. But I don't think that we would argue that there are two types of humans, humans and cats. That is one of the biggest reasons that I became religious, and that I, I affirmed the b- belief in God and in the Bible because I saw the consequences. And it's, a, it's my well-known article. It's on the Internet. I wrote it many years ago, How I Found God at Columbia. Incidentally, I went back to Columbia. They invited me to speak on that subject at Columbia University last year or earlier this year, one of the two. I think it was earlier this year, actually. And remember, we were not allowed to, uh, Columbia University did not allow Prager University to live stream it. Do you recall that? So there's no way to anyone to see that uh, lecture. Is that correct? Because we, I don't think we video, I mean, we should put it up. It's, I think it's an important talk, how I found God at this place. Anyway, uh, that's the article in the New York Times, how you vote will influence your religiosity. The obvious is how your religiosity influences your vote. But if you think the Democratic Party is, is crazed, that the left has gone crazy, and it has, I'm not just talking morally, I'm talking intellectually. Maybe, maybe you should flirt with the idea that abandoning normative Judeo-Christian religions has consequences. Just give it a thought. 
When we come back, USA Today has an article. It's just, uh, it's fascinated by the fact, front page, why there's more crime in Baltimore. I'll explain. Hi, everyone. Dennis Prager here. Before I go to the Baltimore story, the front page of USA Today, I was thinking about why they're uh, just apoplectic about Judge Kavanaugh. Who, by the way, Chuck Schumer, in describing, called him Mr. Kavanaugh. Now, am, am I being hypersensitive here? No, no, I'm asking. I, 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 I have never, I have never said uh, Ms. Bader, uh, Ginsburg. I've never, never once. It seems odd to say of a judge, Mr. or Ms. or Mrs., Ms. Bader Ginsburg said the other day in Cairo, I've talked about her talk in Cairo many times. I always say Judge Judge Ginsburg. I don't think we do that. I, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. But it, it caught my attention. Who was, uh, oh, the Ferguson effect. This is Heather McDonald has, uh, d- has described that. Police, let me ask you, if you're a policeman in any, uh, in any big city police force, right? You are a policeman, and a guy is uh, driving in a funny way. And you pull alongside, and you see that the driver is, is not white. What will you think? I'll tell you what they think. Why should I risk my entire future, my ability to support my family, my good name? The, the, the media will pounce, may pounce upon me as a racist. Uh, I'll just let this, ha- let this go. And that's what's happening, as exactly predicted. Uh, I don't blame the police. I don't. So this is a typical, the screaming by the, uh, that it is amazing that Barack Obama got away with saying Ferguson in speeches as if that was a, an example of police racism. It is so disgusting. It is such an example of the fake news that permeate our media that they let him get away with that lie about the police. Ferguson was not an example of police racism. I don't deny that police racism exists. I don't deny that a lot of bad things on earth exist. But I always ask, in a, are we exaggerating the evil? And if we are, are we, are we then causing more harm? This is a great example, a great example of how the left hurts blacks. That blacks vote left is up there with one of the great riddles of life, why Jews vote left. It's just amazing. Uh, the uh, More and more, there is Israel hatred that permeates the Democratic Party. It already permeates the left all over the world. There's a little tiny Jewish state the size of El Salvador that exists. One of them. That's it. Not two Jewish states, not 52, like there are 52 or 53 Muslim states. And yet Jews vote left. Jews voting left and blacks voting left is one of the most uh, uh, self-inflicted wounds in democratic life, small d, not capital D. The uh, uh, affirmative action has only increased, on, race-based affirmative action has only increased the, the dropout rate of blacks in colleges. That's, that's, what it, that's, that's its achievement. The screaming of, of, of police racism has increased the number of murdered black human beings in the United States of America. This is in USA Today today, not uh, not known for its conservative viewpoint. God was was Donald Trump right in his direct way? What the hell do you have to lose voting Republican? Remember he said that, and he was called a racist for it. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. The thought that a black should vote Republican. Must It must be announced by the left, you're a racist if you say blacks should vote Republican. 
Well, you're a racist if you say that there's only one human race. There's only one race, the human race. That's the University of California. I wrote a whole uh, column on it a few months ago. That's an actual announcement by the University of California. Anyone who says there is only one race, the human race, is racist. Millions of police records show officers in Baltimore respond to calls as quickly as ever. But they now begin far fewer encounters themselves. From 2014 to 2017, dispatch records show the number of suspected narcotic offenses, narcotics offenses, police reported themselves dropped 30%. The number of people they reported seeing with outstanding warrants dropped by 50%. The number of field interviews, instances in which the police approached someone for questioning, dropped 70%. Why would you approach somebody? Immediately upon the riot, policing changed in Baltimore, and it changed very dramatically, says Donald Norris, an emeritus professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who reviewed USA Today's analysis. This is again in today's USA Today front page. The outcome of that change in policing has been a lot more crime in Baltimore, especially murders, and people are getting away with those murders. Police officials acknowledge the change. In all candor, officers are not as aggressive as they once were pre-2015. It's just that fact. Yep. Congratulations, left. More murdered blacks thanks to your hysteria. Boy, is that a perfect segue to my guest, Dinesh D'Souza, who's tolerant, who's more tolerant, the left or the right. It's just, it was like it was set up and it wasn't. Dinesh D'Souza needs no introduction, the best-selling Hello? author. Yep, you're there? I'm here. Hi, Dennis. How are you? I'm very well. I, I was just saying, as we clicked on to you, <laughs> that there was a, this built-in a promo here for the, the latest course at Prague University. And uh, it is Dave Rubin asking, who's more tolerant, the left or the right? And I said, what could be a more perfect segue to Dinesh D'Souza than asking that question in light of the subject that you and I are going to discuss now? Folks, on August 3rd, Dinesh D'Souza's latest movie is going to be released, Death of a Nation. Is the book coming out the same day? Uh, it is. Uh, it comes out that week, Dennis, a few days earlier. Movies, of course, open on the weekend, so uh, the movie opens Friday, August 3rd, and the book of the same title will be in the stores the, um, the, uh, earlier that Tuesday. And, of course, uh, both are titled The Death of a Nation. That's. Uh, did it worry you that that was too dark of a title? Well, a little bit. I, I liked it because, in a certain sense, it's a counterpoint to the, um, the, the kind of pro-Ku Klux Klan movie the Democrats celebrated a century ago called Birth of a Nation. Um, and I also think that the, the apocalyptic title is kind of warranted in, in the sense that we are living through a certain political craziness that you and I have not seen probably in our adult lifetime. Uh, poor Reagan, I think, would be a little bewildered by the sheer not just incivility, but savagery of American politics. You don't don't want to have to go back to Lincoln in 1860 to see when the political waters were this badly roiled. That's right. Uh, Look, I happen to agree with you. I uh, I think that the fate of the United States, the greatest experiment in liberty in history, is on the line right now. Do you have greater optimism in light of the Trump victory than you had, let's say, two years ago? Very much so. I think that uh, I almost uh, have to think of this in, in, in Shakespearean terms, and by that I mean this extremely unlikely man, flawed as he is, comes traipsing on the scene 
Uh, no serious political observer could have given him much of a chance to win, let alone to govern effectively. Um, and the sort of sheer audacity and, and um, you know, zeal with which he pushes things through, his sort of fearlessness in taking on the left, not just on the political but the cultural front. Uh, I'm genuinely a little amazed by Trump, uh, particularly given, you know, Reagan, remember when Reagan came in, Reagan had been seasoned by years and years of political training. He had been in the wilderness. He was governor for two terms. Um, he was a political man through and through. So uh, I would not have expected of Trump the, the level of effectiveness that we're seeing from this man. I remember when never Trumpers would say, oh, you guys who believe that he's going to appoint a conservative to the Supreme Court, you are being bamboozled. Yeah, so the Never Trumpers are, um, you know, they remind me a little bit of Hamlet in the sense that um, they're thinkers, but they think themselves into such a confusion that when it comes time to act, they're paralyzed by indecision. They're so caught up in their own moral qualms that they can't see what needs to be done. It's like this famous scene where Hamlet has the chance to get the king to avenge the murder, to establish rectitude in, De in Denmark, but he won't do it. He's got all these complicated reasons why he can't can't act, uh, and, and he makes the situation far worse. It's a great analogy, actually. So the movie is coming out, and its thesis is what? The movie is essentially an expose of two big lies. Uh, the first big lie is the concept that fascism is on the right. You know, this attack on Trump as a fascist is um, a subset of a much bigger attack that locates fascism on the right end of the spectrum. Uh, the second big lie is the, is the lie that the Republican Party is today the party of bigotry. Uh, and so what I do in the movie is not only do a deep dive into the history uh, of racism in America, but I bring it right to the present and, and, and simply ask the big elef elephant in the room question, who are the racists now? So the two big cards that the left likes to play, the race card and the fascism card, both those cards are exploded in this movie. All right, we're going to come back in a moment. I'm speaking with Dinesh D'Souza. And mark it down because obviously anything he writes or produces is worth seeing and reading. And it's titled Death of a Nation, August 3rd, the book that week. And the movie that day. We'll be back with Dinesh D'Souza in a moment. It's time for me to talk to you about a sponsor. I am seated on my sponsor. <laughs> Is that, am I not right? Is that not accurate? I am sitting on my sponsor, X Chair. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here, continuing my discussion with Dinesh D'Souza, who has a brand-new movie coming out in just a few weeks, August 3rd, along with the book of the same title, Death of a Nation. And that's the question, whether we will observe a death of a nation. And the movie uh, is about uh, two... Uh, two basic uh, principles, and that is that the Democratic Party has, in fact, been the party of racism, and the other is that fascism has been a left-wing phenomenon rather than a right-wing phenomenon. How did it catch on that the word fascism is associated with the right? You know, very interestingly, Dennis, this um, big lie, as I call it, began with FDR, and here's what I mean. Uh, prior to World War II, uh, FDR recognized that fascism was on the left. In fact, he saw it as more progressive than the New Deal. Uh, FDR was never an admirer of Hitler, but he was an admirer of Mussolini. And he actually sent Rexford Tugwell and a group of his own brain trust to Rome, uh, to fascist Italy, to study Italian fascism with the view to bringing some of it here. So there were close ties. Mussolini, for his part, admired FDR. I document all this. Now, once the war started, all of this changed, and then at the end of the war, when American troops went into the concentration camps, when fascism was sort of permanently discredited, then the climate began to change. FDR recognized it even before the end of the war, uh, and he began to give speeches in toward the late 40s, before his death. 
in which he now began to change the meaning of fascism and present fascism as the party of business. He would do this because he would sort of try to portray the Republicans as fascistic, even though, as I say, FDR fully knew that earlier on uh, he himself had looked upon fascism, early fascism, that is, with a great deal of ideological admiration and even emulation. So this is an untold story in American politics. I tell it in the book, but then I also tell it vividly in the movie. How many theaters is it opening? We're opening in a thousand theaters, wow. and one of the beauties is if we do well in the opening weekend, I would urge people to go in the opening weekend, because if we do well, we'll expand to even more theaters uh, the following week. And so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's how movies go. You've got to put fuel in our jet, and the way to do that is to take your friends and go opening weekend. Uh, well, that's why I'm helping you out here. I, I, you're not a sponsor. I, I want my listeners to know. I just think it's important that people see this. By the way, I am just curious because it happened to a couple of my friends in, in making the Gosnell movie. Well, not the, I don't think the Gosnell movie is such, but uh, some of their other movies. Did any actors uh, resign in the middle of the movie? Well, I have to tell you, Dennis, I had started with the idea of shooting this movie in Dallas, and, and we wanted to recreate some powerful scenes, including the, uh, the Nazi uh, book burning of 1933, uh, which I liken to the sort of spread of, of sort of intense political correctness on the campus today. But I realized that the fresh-faced American kids from Dallas just don't look like Nazis. The whole thing took on a kind of a comic character. So we essentially decamped, went to Prague, and shot a lot of the fascism scenes in Europe. And I have to tell you that this gives the movie a feel of authenticity. We have German-speaking actors playing these roles, and the whole thing springs to life in an incredible way. All right. Well, we'll speak closer to the uh, movie, and uh, good luck uh, with it. It's very important, uh, the work you do, Dinesh. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Righto. The bo- again, A Death of a Nation, which the movie will be out August 3rd, and the book will be out. That's Friday, and the book will be out during that week. I do worry whether we're going to have a death of a nation in the United States. I do. And I, I will uh, tell you that it has been, if we don't, it was thus far saved by the victory of Donald Trump in November 2016. And I was a guy who, who, he was my last choice among Republicans. I was wrong. I was simply wrong. History has shown that we were at the brink of disaster, not because of Hillary Clinton. People keep, keep uh, Republicans keep talking about Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is a nothing in my eyes, is, is, is a crook and a nothing. But she, it's, she's irrelevant to me. If the nicest, kindest, most honest Democrat had won, it would have been quite possibly too late to fix this country. This is a very big problem uh, on the right where uh, among and among Republicans who run for office, they think that the problem is this person – It isn't. It's that ideology. It's like in Venezuela. Do you know what most Venezuelans think? Most Venezuelans think the problem is Maduro. The problem was Chavez. It isn't. The problem is socialism. The problem in America is the Democratic Party and the left. It's irrelevant if the person is kind or a crook. Joe Biden is as dangerous to America as Hillary Clinton. There is zero difference between them. And I would say at least half of of Republicans don't understand that. Lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. Maybe so. Maybe she's a crook deserving of of prosecution in a a court of law. But it is of of no emotional interest to me. My, My interest is defeating the left Kind leftists are as damaging as cruel leftists. Okay, that makes sense. We have an ideological battle for the future of this country. Do you believe in borders? I, it's incredible to even ask the question. That that question needs to be asked is astonishing. The left has never believed in borders, and yesterday where I had the the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Immigration on in the third hour, he he opened my eyes. 
to how many people have a vested interest in illegal immigrants from Latin America, including his own, and he is a devout Catholic, his own Catholic church. I didn't realize how much money the government gives the Catholic churches to take care of, uh, of illegal immigrants or even legal immigrants from Latin America. And then big business who profit likewise from illegal immigrants. It's quite an unholy alliance. And then there's the rest of us who actually believe that borders matter. Borders make nations. No borders, no nations. It's that simple. We shall return. I'm Dennis Prager. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. That was very intelligent. I want to give my, uh, I want to uh, salute my engineer, Phil. It's really great to work with you. What did I call you one year? Remember the, that was the best. December 31st. No, he's right. It was Scott. December 31st, a few years ago, when I went through my list of people, but I want to thank, and I was totally sincere said my uh, and, and then finally came to the two guys I sit with every day and I got the living martyr's name right Alan and then Triple G I called close, him Scott but no cigar I wasn't even close actually All right anyway Woodrow in Chicago it's Woodrow of Chicago the famous Woodrow hi Good, uh, good afternoon Mr. Prager it's an honor to speak with you long time listener first time caller that's the best. That's the best. My favorite. The longtime <laughs> listeners, first time callers. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I uh, just wanted to respectfully disagree with you uh, on the, the idea that uh, the more religious a person is, they vote Republican. By me, uh, and, and it's from my experience being a black American, that the majority of, of, of blacks are religious. But they are secular or charismatic, which has, with the theology, is more liberal leaning. Then uh, uh, the teachings are more are more liberal than uh, conservative. Do you, do you Woodrow? Do you attend church regularly? I I used to uh, being an ordained minister uh, out of Koji denomination, but when I began to study uh, the Word of God in Hebrew and Greek. Then I begin to have a different understanding of what the, uh, the denomination taught. And which, therefore, which and, and wait, 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 and therefore you became more conservative or, or what? I became more conservative. I became more conservative because... You're my man. Hey, you are my man. You, you, <laughs> you are a living embodiment of what I believe, that the better you know the Bible, the more conservative you'll be. Yes, yes, and I, but but I think religion and 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 uh, relationship with God is two different things because we have different religions, the denominations that teach different things. I believe God's word only teaches one thing. I I believe once we be, uh, we study it and find out what God is saying. Right. And, and with- well, God bless you. Uh, I. I- I would I would love to know the data on young blacks and religiosity. It would be and I would be very curious. Look, Jesse Jackson's a reverend, Al Sharpton's a reverend, and they're uh, leftists. They're radical leftists. All right, we shall return. I'm Dennis Prager. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain Free Studio. Newsmax TV, the Joe Pag Show. Glad to have you along for the ride, and really glad to have back Dinesh D'Souza, movie maker, best-selling author, generally just a great guy. Dinesh, how are you? Joe, great to be on the show as always. You know, it's uh, it's always special to have you on. We had you on last week to talk about the pardon, and I'm going to ask you right up front, you know, how you feel if that's still if that's sunk in yet. But let me get the name of the book and the movie out right now: "Death of a Nation." Um, and the subtitle for the movie is "Can We Save America a Second Time?" You said there's a different subtitle for the book, right? 
Yeah, the book is subtitled Plantation Politics and the Making of the Democratic Party. Nice. Uh, but the two will come out together, same title, and some of the, many of the same themes covered in both. And, and when is it coming out? Is it still early August? Yes, the first week of August, the book comes out, and that weekend, August 3rd, the movie will be in over a 1,000 theaters nationwide. And, you know, we've talked about this before, Joe. It's really important for people, if they can, to go see it that first weekend yeah. because it puts fuel into our rocket and it helps us go expand to even more theaters. And for those on the left or the right, th- this isn't about left and right. This is about Dinesh actually exposing the true history of our country that we're not learning from the educational system, we're not learning it from the media, not learning it from Hollywood. So this is really, really important stuff. You've got to go and, and, uh, and see the this movie and go read the book. I, I want to ask you before we di- a deep dive into the book and the movie, um, how does it feel, man? Has it sunk in yet that you are, in fact, oh a my gosh. man? I mean, you know, initially, um, I felt certainly the sense of elation, and it became obvious to me that my life will improve in many practical ways. I mean, I don't have to get a judge's permission to travel anymore, right. and I don't have a probation officer visiting my house and breathing down my neck, and I don't have one day out of you know, five days a week to have to devote to community service, thus inhibiting my productivity. So all of this little stuff is what I focused on. But it's occurred to me this is much bigger than that. The the pardon is ultimately, I mean, it's a great up yours to Obama, number one. (laughs) (laughs) And number two, it just lifts that kind of felon badge that the Obama holder Justice Department had managed to sort of hang around my neck. Right. And now it's gone. And what a what a liberating feeling. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you. And the president does the right thing. Something that should have been a slap on the wrist turned into a felony, which is ridiculous. It's Dinesh D'Souza. He, of course, a great movie maker, best-selling author, uh, a lecturer. If he's anywhere near where you are, make sure you go and see Dinesh when he's lecturing. The name of the new movie is Death of a Nation. Can we save America a second time? And um, what's interesting about this is I, I see the Hollywood Reporter story, and it was going to be my first question, too. But my question isn't loaded like you did this to help Trump and now Trump you know, scratched your back in return. My question is, h- how soon when you started to release this and you knew you were going to release this after being pardoned, did you realize the first ridiculous question from the left would be, did you run out and make a movie as soon as Trump you know, did this favor for you? You knew that was coming, right? Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the pardon came as a bolt from the blue. And in fact, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, it was, it was Ted Cruz who sort of buttonholed Trump and put the question to him. Yeah. Uh, and then it took about 30 days for that process to take place. But I should say this, the idea for the movie, uh, rolled. and we drafted scripts in the fall. We did shooting in Europe and in America in January. We've been editing this movie now for weeks. And even the movie poster, which actually has a kind of morphed image of, of Lincoln and Trump, that poster was submitted to the Motion Picture Association of America. for So all of this predates the pardon, and the, the two are completely unconnected. Um, and so any speculation of the contrary is just flat out wrong. Is there a website for this movie? Normally you've got the movie name as a website. Yes, absolutely. There is one, and I think if you just Google Death of a Nation movie, it will pull it up. Obviously, you can get information on my website, which is DineshD'Souza.com. Okay. So we'll we'll be releasing a trailer shortly. Uh, at this point, we're just announcing the movie and putting out the poster. And just the very association of Lincoln and Trump is getting a lot of attention. But well, yeah. I think it's justified, um, Joe, because really the surreal atmosphere of American politics now just the craziness of it, I think Reagan would find almost incomprehensible. You'd have to go back to 1860 to find a time when the Democrats so fanatically refused to accept the result of a free election. So that alone... The commonality of the situation links Trump and Lincoln. It's uh, Dinesh D'Souza. The new movie is Death of a Nation. Also the new book, Death of a Nation. You've got to check out the movies and books all together because they're they're such great references for each other. And and they really are great partners every time you do something like this. Um, The left, for some reason, has co-opted Abraham Lincoln. He was a Republican. He was the guy and the party, the leader of the party that freed the slaves, that won the Civil War. The Civil War wasn't North versus South. It was Republican versus Democrat. And people have learned that from you. But you dared, as you just mentioned, to morph Lincoln's face, who everybody holds up on high as a saint, 
um, and everybody wants him to be part of their whatever their view of history is with a guy that the left is is, is touting as a racist, homophobe, misogynist, horrible person, Twitter fiend. I mean, when you did that, you knew what was going to happen, right? Well, you have to remember that there was there were incendiary accusations very different accusations that the Democrats made against Lincoln. I mean, first of all, they spread the rumor that Lincoln was actually black. They, they called wow. him Abraham Africanus I. And then they uh, tried to defeat him even during the Civil War. The Northern Democrats were conspiring in all kinds of ways with the Confederacy to undermine Lincoln. They assassinated Lincoln after the war. And so Lincoln was the nightmare of the Democratic Party in somewhat of the same way that Trump is the nightmare of the Democratic Party now. It, it, it's stunning because there are a lot of parallels. And what this president is doing to bring regular Americans together is, I think, historic. But at the same time, Dinesh, do we, is it just because the population is so much bigger or is it because of the, the omnipresence of media, social media and the like now? Because we seem to see the elites are more separated than they've ever been. But the regular Americans, we truly are coming together under this guy. Yes. Now, one great advantage that Lincoln had was he was able to unite the Republican Party behind him. And right. that became a very important source of his strength. I do think long term that Trump, in order to win this, in order to, to defeat this whole kind of deep state operation being mounted, uh, not just through the government, but through the media and Hollywood and so on, Trump does need the Republicans. And so I'm really hoping that this movie, by, by sort of telling a new story, by, 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 by ultimately showing the glorious history of the Republican Party, right. will motivate Republicans to realize that they can actually get behind Trump and we can accomplish together a great deal. Uh, movie maker, movie producer, movie star, also best-selling author Dinesh D'Souza, great lecturer. Find him where he is. Go to DineshD'Souza.com. The new movie and book, Death of a Nation, you've got to go and check it out. Um, when we talk about the history of the Republican Party, and again, I've learned so much from you over the years, um, it completely academia. Can we say academia, media, and something else? Or is it truly that, that public schools and the public school, school system um, is why why we feel the way we feel, and by we, I don't mean you and I, but we as a country still feel that the left is the right and the right is the left. Well, when we look at these progressive, uh, you know, big lies, as I, I call them, yeah. both about racism uh, and about fascism, we have to realize that all are most ferociously echoed now, and they focus on Trump, they long predate Trump. I mean, the lies about the two parties switching sides, about Nixon's Southern strategy, this goes back to the 1960s. This is when the progressives came up with this. And the big lies about fascism go back even further to the 1940s. You have to remember that fascism was, uh, was very popular among progressives before World War II. Yeah. Progressives loved the fascists, and the fascists loved the progressives. I mean, FDR was routinely celebrated in the Nazi press as being a fantastic leader. And the Germans said things like, we are trying to imitate FDR. Wow. We're only scared that he might fail. You know, the New Deal is basically another word for fascism. Now, after World War II, when fascism basically became radioactive and the concentration camps were liberated, and then the progressives were coming to power in academia and the media. They were like, whoa, we don't want young people to find out about all this. Yeah. And so then began the process of sort of doctoring history, concealing information, leaving it out of the textbooks. And I think most ingeniously trying to move fascism from the left wing column to the right wing column. Yeah, you mentioned the Southern strategy and Richard Nixon. And I've talked to you at length about this. When you talk about the true history of the Republican and the Democratic Party in this country and you tell the truth, you get attacked on social media by two billion people who all say Southern strategy and the big switch. Now, I always respond this way and you're way smarter than I am. And you tell me this all the time. But if you can Re remind me if this is right or not. My answer to them always is, was there a convention? Was there a party? What was the gathering where the big switch happened? And how did it happen? Did they shake hands and say, you be a D, I'll be an R, have a nice day, best to your wife? A and, and secondarily, the Southern strategy is BS. Richard Nixon desegregated this country more than just about anybody. So, I'm not, Dinesh, am I off base when I respond to them that way? 
No, you're on the right track. And we take this on very systematically, both in the book and the movie, and just crush it. And I'll just put out a small detail that I think is very telling. So the basic thesis here is that Nixon was kind of a racist. Now, true, the progressives say he didn't make uh, overt racist campaign statements. I mean, they haven't been able to find a single one. So they say, well, what happened is that Nixon was doing these dog whistles, these kind of coded signals to the racists in the Deep South. Now, the problem with this is that, first of all, as soon as Nixon got elected, one of the first things he did is he invented affirmative action. Right. Nixon implemented the first affirmative action giving legal preferences to blacks over whites. So the first question you have to ask yourself is, does this sound like a racist? <laughs> right. I mean, a guy who's supposedly sending dog whistles and signals right. to deep south racists is not going to give legal preferences to blacks over whites. So... But all of this nonsense, I, I call it Wikipedia scholarship, yeah. is been pushed out there, and people who, who know nothing about the history, who've never read Kevin Phillips, The Emerging Republican Majority, who don't know who actually won the Deep South vote, they continue to mouth this as if it's sort of as if just repeating these mantras makes them true. But yeah. we dissect this stuff and really blow it, blow it apart in the book and the movie. I want you to go check out Death of a Nation movie. Google that or go to DineshDeSouza.com. Find out where he's speaking. Go and take in the speech and the lecture. It's amazing. Um, Death of a Nation is also a book. Go and get the book. Uh, Dinesh, I've got to quickly ask you, you're a movie guy. You've been in the movies for a while. You know how the business works. Uh, I love uh, Robert De Niro when he's reading somebody else's lines. He's expert. He is the best. Uh, when he's when he's speaking for himself, he's kind of an idiot. Do you know what his problem is, or or what Hollywood's problem is with Trump? Because saying he's a racist or he's horrible or he's a dog, that's easy to say. But he, none of these people back any of this stuff up. You know, I think Joe, this is a little, this is a kind of lunatic asylum that they've got going <laughs> in Hollywood. I mean, certainly at least as far as politics is concerned. And for somebody like me who grew up, grew up in India watching movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and yeah. The Godfather, I was such a huge fan of people like Jack Nicholson and Robert De Niro. And then in my mature life to come and see that these people are essentially clinical morons, yeah. you know, <laughs> who, 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 who don't have an original thought and are full of venom. I mean, venom unsubstantiated with intelligence. I mean, it's just as heartbreaking to see. And I kind of wish that I, you know, just stayed with the early movies and never heard another word out of them out. Yeah. Now, I-, I couldn't agree more. Dinesh, I want to leave you with with one question about current events. You've got the big summit with the president and with Kim Jong-un. Um, and, and the left originally said Kim Jong-un was the puppet master, made the, the meeting happen. Then President Trump canceled it. And the left said, oh, my God, President Trump hates peace. And then he then he put the meeting back on. He said, oh, look, you know, Kim is pulling all the strings again. Are you surprised by anything the left has done? in response to this very positive thing the president's trying to do? I mean, it it is a measure of the unbelievable fear and loathing of Trump that you literally have people from Bill Maher to others wishing that the economy would collapse, wishing that the summit would fail, wishing that essentially we basically have poverty and, and world chaos in order for them to be able to prove and say, aha, Mm. We told you so about this guy. So this shows the level of venom that we have reached in the, in the country. This is kind of why I say that poor Reagan would be a little bit of a fish out of water. But Lincoln, see, Lincoln understood these roiled waters. He faced them in his own time, and he responded with a kind of firmness and principle that I think Republicans can learn, including Trump, learn a lot from today. The name of the movie is Death of a Nation. Can we save America the second time, a second time? Uh, the name of the book is also Death of a Nation with a different subtitle. The author and the movie maker, the producer, it is Dinesh D'Souza. He is must-see movie guy. He's also must-read author. Um, I promise you, you will get an education. And you'll walk out of the theater and say to yourself, I had no idea about most of what I just learned. Dinesh, thanks a million. My pleasure. Okay, we're back after this in the Joe Pag Show. Stay right here.